Uh, we are starting new topic today, and uh, for the next uh, five lectures, we will uh, be talking about the uh, UTI. And Dr. Imna will start with the introduction and the uh, uh, microbiology of the uh, urinary tract, including barriers and uh, colonizers. So, proceed, Dr. Imna. Uh, so, as Dr. Faraj has already told, that today we are starting a new section of uh, infections. So the first topic is what causes infections. So I am, will be discussing the microbiology of the genitourinary tract. My objectives are barriers of the genitourinary tract, the colonization of genitourinary tract, and I will describe some common uropathogens and what they do. So uh, this is kind of um, uh, an um, schematic diagram that shows that these are the three things that is defense in the defect in the local host defenses that is defects in the barriers of the GU tract which I will be describing now. Then the bacteria gets the uh, route for entry and the colonization when the bacteria um, stays there and divides and divides. So these are the three things that correlate simultaneously to um, uh, develop a UTI. So what are uropathogens? Uropathogens are organisms that cause UTI. UTI does not mean urethral terrorist incident. So this is, as you can see, this is an E. coli. It is a uropathogen and uh, it has uh, got a TNT and it has got a match stick, which is the virulence factors basically of an organism. And the thing he is trying to set on fire is the barrier. Okay, so now you have an idea what are barriers and what are uh, the uh, virulence factors and what are uropathogens? So UTI is an inflammatory response of the urothelium to bacterial invasion that is usually associated with bacteriuria and pyuria. So it means that UTI is associated with bacteriuria and pyuria. Bacteriuria and pyuria does not mean that there is UTI. So it is a variety of clinical condition. It can range from lower urinary tract symptoms to pyelonephritis and to urosepsis and can cause death. It is a very common problem and up to half of the women will suffer at least one episode of UTI in their lifetime. So what are uncomplicated and complicated UTI? By the definition, uncomplicated UTI means uh, UTI occurring in normal healthy patients whose urinary tract is structurally and functionally normal. So it is limited to most common, um, mostly this definition is limited to adult and non-pregnant women. Complicated UTI is the symptomatic infection of the bladder and kidneys, and it is in the presence of a structure or functional abnormality. However, all the infections in the pediatric age group and in men come under the heading of complicated UTI. I don't know why. Maybe the males have a structurally or functionally abnormal genitourinary tract. But if male has a UTI, it is always a complicated UTI. For a male to get a UTI is very, very little bit uh, means it, it is uh, uh, very rare because the system of the urinary tract is uh, far away from the colonizers like uh, NS and the fecal contents. So if the female, if the male got a UTI, it means the most likely patient is having a, either anatomical or either functional dysfunction in the form of bladder auto obstruction or bladder dysfunction or sort of. So uh, and female patient, uh, because of the uh, uh, length of the urethra is uh, very small and it is near to the uh, NS, uh, there is a high chance of getting uh, uh, IUTI even with a simple uh, induction, so that's why most most of the UTI in the uh, in the male is labeled as a complicated. Okay, so here is a question that a twenty five year old female presented to ER with complaint of fever and dysuria for one day, and the ur in the urine DRs uh, in nitrites are positive. So is it a complicated or a non complicated, uncomplicated UTI? Anyone can answer. Doctor Bakhtar. Mm -hmm. Female patient, young female, one day fever, dysuria, nitrite positive. Should we label it as a complicated or uncomplicated UTI? 
Thank you, Dr. Bakhtawar. What, this is why, complicated. What, what if this is a male patient, 25? Okay. So moving on to bacteriuria. Bacteriuria is the presence of bacteri bacteria in the urine as it can be classified as symptomatic or asymptomatic. So a patient with asymptomatic bacteriuria is defined as having colonization with one or more organisms without symptoms or infections. Historically, it was defined as a 10 raised to power 5 colony forming units, but now this is not the thing. And now asymptomatic bacteriuria means the patient is symptom free no matter the bacterial count. Because previously, the urine was considered to be a sterile environment. However, as the knowledge of uh, the micro microbiome increases, we now know that urine is not a sterile environment. There are a lot of com uh, commensals that live there. And there is just a gut microbiome. Hoti hai, gut ki apne bacteria hai, jinko antibiotics nahi marna chahiye. Also, urine also has that, which protect the basically urinary tract from the infections. So that colony forming unit things is obsolete now. The asymptomatic bacteriuria is defined as having colony with one or more organism in a urine specimen without any symptom. The symptomatic bacteriuria is associated with an infection in the urinary tract. If bacteriuria, there, is, there are bacteria, bacteria in the urine and the patient has symptoms, so it's not bacteriuria, it's basically a UTI. <clears throat> bacteriuria without pyuria is generally indicative of, of bacterial colonization without infection of the urinary tract. It means that pyuria is uh, white blood cells are there, but there are no bacteria, so there must be some other cause. Like I will discuss a slide later. So asymptomatic bacterial bacteriuria has been shown to protect against recurrent symptomatic infections with more virulent stains, same as in the GI tract. We now know that there is a microbiome, and we give probiotics to the patient, and we avoid prescribing many antibiotics. So same as with the uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria that you should not give antibiotics to every patient coming with bacteria in the urine DR. Bacteriuria is in, uh, in itself usually does not warrant treatment unless the patient is pregnant or is if the patient is to undergo certain endourological procedure just can the mucosal trauma ho sakta. Or there is a third indication which is plus or minus. It's like uh, within a month of a renal transplant the recipient. So you can treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in that uh, recipient. Otherwise, the two uh, indications are these. So a 25-year-old pregnant lady presents to OPD for regular checkup with no active complaint. Her TLC is normal and her urine culture showed E. coli. So she, she's pregnant and she has E. coli and no symptoms. So is it a complicated or a no uncomplicated UTI? Why pregnancy leads to complicated UTI? So there is a functional and anatomical disruption of the urinary tracts. I mean, there is mechanical obstruction caused by the fetus, and there is hormonal stimulation on the uh, ureter muscle lead to dilatation. This may lead to easily uh, uh, colonization and uh, proliferation of the bacteria lead to the uh, acute polynephritis, most of the, the cases. So in female patient, pregnant lady, it is usually complicated. So, so should it be treated? Uh, yes, it should be treated. Yes, because the patient is pregnant. And I told you that there are uh, two uh, indications of treating an asymptomatic bacteria is that the patient is pregnant or the patient is to undergo certain endourological procedure. So now coming on to pyuria, as I already mentioned that uh, bacteriuria with pyuria is not an indicator of infection. Um, so what it indicates, pyuria is the presence of white blood cells in the urine and pyuria without bacteriuria or sterile pyuria can be associated with pathologies such as renal stone disease, malignancy like CIS or tuberculosis of the renal tract. So uh, if there is pyuria but no bacteriuria, you are not going to label it as a UTI and bacteriuria and pyuria are not synonymous with a UTI. Bacteriuria is a different thing. Pyuria is a different thing. If they both combine the patient and the patient has symptoms, he or she is said to have a UTI, but these terms, they do not mean a UTI. So what is this? This uh, is the first objective of my presentation. That is the barriers of the genitourinary tract, also known as the natural defenses of our body. So 
if we imagine this is a bacteria or a virus or whatever europathogen and these are some barriers that he that organism has to cross to get access to the uh, urinary tract to cause infection so uh, just a little review from uh, um, the MBBS lectures or something, that immune system is of two types, innate and adaptive. Innate immune immunity has also two types, the physical barriers and the ce uh, cells, white blood cells like mo monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. While the adaptive immunity consists of the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes produce immunoglobulins and the T lymphocytes are cytotoxics and helper and suppressor and they have CD4 markers. So this is a little overview. So you know that when I am talking about a barrier, so you know in which category it falls. Which one responds faster for UTI? Innate or adaptive? In Dr. Gulris? Which one responds faster for an infection? Innate immune system or adaptive immune system? Innate. Yes, any innate immune system is already there. But adaptive system has to adapt something, so it takes weeks to um, give a response, while innate immunity is always been there. So it's your first line of defense. Say like I managed, so this, this, this is the physical barrier, it's the first line of defense, the phagocytes are the second line of defense, and adaptive immunity is the third line of defense. So uh, barriers of the uh, genitourinary tract. First of all, there is um, uh, if there uh, is a female, there there are lactobacillus. Lactobacillus uh, basically live in the vagina and they create an acidic pH. They convert glycogen to lactic acid and the and they lower pH. The more acidic the pH, the more unfavorable the conditions for the bacterial growth. Okay, then uh, so uh, UTIs. Um, are less common in female patients yes if they are sexually um, active so utis can happen because um, this disrupts the lactobacillus system uh, another thing the urine itself is also uh, a host mechanism for the um, uh, people um, because of its unidirectional flow what do i mean by the unidirectional flow that for example if a patient has um, got a reflux so they, what they did, they did an experiment in rats and uh, with a vesicouteral reflux. So they tied off one of the ureter and the infected urine then went up to the kidneys to cause um, pyelonephritis in the other kidney in which the ureter was not ligated. So it means the unidirectional flow from kidney to the bladder is very essential in pre preventing uh, the patient, uh, the human for, from infections. Also... Uh, the higher concentration of urea in the urine also does not let microorganisms live. The organic acid concentration, organic acids come from fruits and vegetables. So they also uh, cause less and less uh, urinary tract infections. And a pH, an acidic pH also uh, prevents from the infection and also the exfoliation of the urothelial cells because uh, apoptotic epithelial cells are released into the bladder lumen through exfoliation. So uh, uh, um, reducing the load of the old cells and the bacteria that are dead. So it keeps on exfoliating and uh, keeps on uh, giving the host a renewed environment in which the bacteria cannot easily invade. So uh, why epithelium, uh, uh, urothelium? What makes urothelium special? So there is a coating of uh, glycose aminoglycans. It is like a plastic cover like the lamination sheet you put on your uh, paper to prevent it from getting uh, wet or dirty. So glycose aminoglycans act as a plastic cover on the urothelium and prevent from the infections. Another thing is, and they um, reduce pathogen adherence because as I already mentioned that uh, pathogens have some virulence factors, like for example, they have some weapons. So this plastic coating protects the urothelium from their weapons. Now, another thing is the toll-like receptors. So basically, these are the receptors that are already present, present in the urothelium, and their activation leads to the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and it uh, attracts the neutrophils and asks them to come and get the bacteria. 
Uroplakin are the glycoprotein plates. They also uh, 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 act like a plastic coating material. Euromodulin or TAM horsefoil protein, they also inhibit bacterial growth and colonization. They are secreted by the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So, um, as you can see, uh, these, uh, these are all uh, the mechanism that I just described, that this is the Euromodulin that, uh, that, in, that is acting as a plastic coating and, in, and is inhibiting adherence. There is um, uh, neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalcin. What is, uh, it makes the bladder and iron scarce environment. The iron is not present uh, in the bladder, uh, bladder and in the urine that is present in the bladder. While iron is an essential nutrient which is uh, needed for every living thing to survive. So it inhibits iron receptors. And there is also, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, uh, toll-like receptors which are, uh, which are, uh, attract the cytokines and the inflammatory uh, cells and ask the neutrophils to come uh, and phagocytose the bact uh, bacteria whereas the adaptive B cells um, the adaptive in, in the adaptive immunity pathway they will secrete a immunoglobulin A that helps in the neutralization of the bacterial toxins so this is a short summary that uromodulin tam horsefall protein they inhibit adherence uh, the mm, Neutrophil uh, gelatinase associated lipoprotein, it inhibits iron receptors and makes the bladder an iron scarce environment. Um, there is also a thing called pentraxin that helps in the phagocytosis of the bacteria. AMP increases the membrane lysis, IgGA increases the neutralization, and neutrophils cause phagocytosis and epithelial cells cause inflammation. So basically, these are the barriers of the genitourinary tract and this is their response to their pathogens. Cytotoxic cells also express mannose receptors, which act on the type 1 pili of many strains of E. coli, and these receptors can facilitate phag phagocytosis. In men, uh, uh, as I mentioned that in women, in women that lactobacillus is present in the vagina, which ca causes an acidic pH and prevents a woman from having a UTI. But after um, post-menopause, this mechanism disrupts. So similarly, men also have a mechanism. Their prostate, uh, prostate secretes fluid containing zinc, which has antimicrobial properties. But as the male ages, so the prostate becomes enlarged and causes retention, and this mechanism does not efficiently work, thus leading, um, making him, him susceptible to UTIs. So this is the summary of the urinary tract host defense mechanisms. In the urine, there is acidic pH, high urine osmolality, urinary inhibitors of bacterial ad adherence, like I told, glycosaminoglycans, uroplicans, stem horse roll proteins, and this uh, TAM uh, toll like receptors, which are competitive inhibitors of attachment to uroepithelial cells, and then mechanical flushing of the urine flow. And mucosa contains urothelial secretions of cytokines and chemokines, which are called by the toll like receptors. Uh, mucopolysaccharide lining increases difficulty of bacterial penetration, mucosal IgGA, and in men, the prostatic secretions that contain bactericidal zinc, and their urethra is also longer. So these were the barriers. Now, how the uh, uropathogen crosses these barriers and enters the urinary tract to cause infection. So there are the four routes of entry. <clears throat> see, as you can see, there is ascending route, there is hematogenous route, and there are lymphatics. And there is one uh, other route that is uh, the direct uh, infection, the direct spread of the bacteria. So the most common, around 90%, is the periurethral bacteria with uropathogen from gut. So basically, um, this is um, lower UTI is caused with contamination of uh, gut uropathogens. They colonize in the urethra, and in females, the urethra is short. It is in close proximity to NS, so it helps in the colonization uh, of the uh, organism, and which ascend to the bladder, and then where bacteria multiply, and the, they form biofilms. If 
uh, the organism's host defense are not very weak and if he or she takes treatment in this stage this does not progress to upper UTIs but if that uh, bladder epithelial is damaged by the bacteria or the uropathogen they migrate to the kidneys and cause more dam damage in the upper urinary tract and urosepsis so the uncommon roots are hematogenous spreads which are you as you see i have written here staphylococcus uh, uh, aureus because MRSA is um, uh, methicil if, if they are methicillin resistant they are called MRSA, and they are mostly acquired from uh, hospitals and in infection from the blood so this in infection uh, in the blood bacteremia causes the kidney to become infected candida species and mycobacterium tuberculosis um, lymphatogenous spread from rectal colonic and periuterine lymphatics this is a very rare root and direct extension of bacteria intraperitoneal abscesses vesicointestinal or vesicovaginal fistulas so uh, colonization of the uh, genitourinary tract so what do you mean by colonization colonization is the establishment of the colony of microorganisms at a particular site So that was a short video about the colonization of the bacteria that basically um, like uh, humans form colonies uh, if they go to a new place and try to make peace with the surrounding environment, try to make the things work. But uh, when um, the native area of the people become weak, like the natural host defenses become, these colonies can cause, uh, can wage a war and cause infections. So there are some host factors that are associated with the uh, colonization uh, because women, they have a shorter urethra and relatively proximity of uh, close proximity of the urethra to the anus and the use of spermicides, which disrupts the uh, normal um, uh, uh, acidic environment and of the uh, vagina and they also also cause the lactobacillus to die which makes the vagina acidic so the use of a spermicide can, is a host factor for colonization and the reduced estrogen levels levels later in the life um genetic factors there are some genetic factors which causes recurrent uti uh, uh, in women and these genetic uh, like i was discussing the tam horse wall proteins like i was discussing uh, the europlicans there are some receptors involved like cxcr1 gene and things like these which are not readily tested nowadays so these kind of genetic uh, deficiencies increases the susceptibility uh, for uh, urinary tract infections in patients from a um, uh, particular genetic background so structure abnormalities like um, there is a catheter placed here so it causes the structure abnormality the, if the bladder is neurogenic um, and high pressure there is reflux and the urine goes back into the kidneys if there is stones or if there is a urinary stoma so these are the uh, structure structural and functional abnormalities that makes a, a host susceptible for colonization and later on infections a urinary catheter disrupts soul defenses, including it damages the uh, uroepithelial mucosal bar barrier. It uh, facilitates formations of the bacterial biofilms, and it provides reservoirs for uh, potentially harmful pathogens. So these are the abnormalities that lead to colonization of the urinary tract. So 40-year-old male with history of a spinal cord injury on suprapubic catheter for last two years came for regular checkup with no active complaint. His last urine culture was positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. What kind of a problem he has actually? Basically, what type of infection he has? So, Dr. Ekra, so, so probably catheter, neurogenic bladder and the 
कल्चर पॉजिटिव colonization yes, yes because the patient did not came come to you with any complaint he just came for a regular check up and he showed you his last culture that showed that he has got pseudomonas should we start antibiotics for that no no need of antibiotic for what should we do then change his catheter maybe and does urine culture need to be sent in each follow up no it does not need to be sent because no. we know that these kind of uh, tubes and plastics they are um um or make the patient susceptible for colonization do we have to give antibiotic when we change the catheter of such patient prophylaxis sort of why you just you just remove the catheter that contains the bacteria and you are not inserting something new they, they recommend now cystoscopy can be done without anti antibiotic so you just remove the source and insert another catheter in my opinion i don't think we we need to give a prophylaxis antibiotic if you just remove the catheter and insert new catheter and i don't think he need antibiotics okay sir yeah so uh, as i just mentioned that asymptomatic bacteria Prof. Uh, here uh, i would like to make a comment uh, that you just mentioned about the uh, during single dose prophylactic antibiotic for change of catheter there is a uh, reference literature available which shows the decreases the risk of breakthrough utis and uh, the patient where you are have to keep them for long term catheterization it is still there uh, though it is not in recommendation like eau recommendation and for cystoscopy if there is asymptomatic bacteria urea where you are using the word of colonization for guideline they use the word of asymptomatic bacteria urea you don't need to treat that but there are certain procedure in urology where you need to treat them as well one of them is uds uh, we are talking here about simple change of catheter yes single dose is still there no it's not <laughs> but we will find references for any everything you know on the internet but uh, there is um a standard uh, literature or reference in which you need to uh, convey to the examiner or because the current guideline says that there is no need to uh, give there are only two uh, recommendations for giving antibiotic in the asymptomatic bacteria urea that is if the patient is pregnant or if you are going to do a procedure which can cause mucosal disruption and plus minus another thing is if the patient is one month post op renal transplant that's it so um these are some of the um what what was it so uh, this these are the uh, uh, some of the um, factors that uh, cause recurrent utis in patients like uh, if the host has any anatomic abnormalities like high grade vur or behavioral abnormalities like voiding dysfunction the genetic uh, tendency i was talking about which make the host susceptible for colonization or infections it's like cxcr genes uh, uh, toll like receptors deficiency or tumor necrosis alpha factor or there's problem with their uromodulin so these kind of things make the patient susceptible for um, uh, they have the familial tendency to develop uh, utis again and again and the environment like this use of spermicides and frequent sexual intercourse also some pathogens they are like very resistant like for for example like e coli they causes biofilm uh, create biofilms they causes pods on the lining of the urothelium in which they live and whenever that pod disrupts so they um, um release a new colony of the bacteria in the urine so these are the some fact uh, these are some factors which makes uh, make patient uh, susceptible for having colonization and if the if the defense is weak later uti so uh biofilms what are biofilms biofilms are multicellular microorganism communities which are enmeshed with a protective scaffold of extracellular material which include polysaccharide and the dna we normally call it slime so you see these bacteria are happily happily living in the biofilms and this is the layer of polysaccharides and extracellular dna that is protecting them this is the antibiotic or uh, some detergent or chlorine like agent which is um, just sad and cannot get it get its um, uh, weapon through and kill the microorganisms now biofilms is not a problem of a urinary tract only it is present literally everywhere 
on every surface, like in pipes, like in the, on the surface, on our courts, on the beds of the hospitals, and they are very resistant to cleaning agents and to antibiotics. Biofilm formation protects the individual organism from the host immune systems and uh, uropathogenic E. coli can form such bacterial communities within the uroepithelium. They uh, live intracellularly and they make the reservoirs there and act, for nida, act as a nidus for recurrent infections. Urinary catheters and other prosthetic devices, like I told you, plastics, they are tempting targets for biofilm form, uh, formation by organisms. What is biofilm? When some of the bacteria free in the water settle on surfaces in contact with the liquid, they start to duplicate, forming a layer usually known as biofilm. Free floating bacteria represent just 10% of the total number of bacteria in a piping system. Indeed, 90% of microorganisms live in biofilm, not free in the liquid. When biofilm is mature, parts of it can detach, cross-contaminating other points of the piping system. Biofilm causes many different issues. A 20 micron thick biofilm reduces thermal efficiency by 30% and more. Biofilm causes MIC, microbiologically influenced corrosion. Biofilm is the ideal environment for the survival and proliferation of pathogens. Contact us for more info about biofilm, biofilm monitoring, and prevention of biofilm-related issues. So basically, uh, they were uh, ex uh, explaining a biofilm in a pipe. So they were um, they were telling about the thermal resistant thing. So I can tell you that, uh, if you imagine that as a Foley catheter, um, by if the biofilms are formed, it makes uh, the antibiotics two hundred times more difficult to get through uh, the biofilm and to the uh, organisms. So P uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, like the scenario I discussed, is notorious for forming biofilms. Uh, and there is Porteus midabilis, which uh, is related to the stone disease. It also causes crystalline biofilms and Enterococcus fe uh, fecalis. It utilizes fibrinogen that is also uh, cre that also creates biofilms. So these are the organisms that are very hard to eradicate. They are present everywhere and they live in bi micro uh, biofilms and um, they disrupt the urinary drainage system that can lead to infection extension. So now I uh, this is the third part of my presentation that is the common uropathogens. The unit I can potentially be infected by a wide range of organisms that includes bi viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. The most common uropathogen is E. coli that causes 85% uh, of the in, uh, UTIs in total. And the O0 group of the E. coli is the most pathogenic. These are the names of some other bacteria that are common uropathogens. Uh, hospital acquired Hospital acquired, maybe uh, the most common cause is E. coli. The second, e, second to E. coli are Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, and group beta hemolytic streptococci in pregnant women. <laughs> so uh, these are some uh, common urinary contaminants which live in the urine. The, as I was saying that uh, as we previously considered urine to be sterile, this uh, theory is now um, under consideration because of our increased knowledge of the microbiome. So there are organisms that live in the urine and they are not all bad. So these include some anaerobic bacteria, the lactobacilli, the corny bacteria, and the streptococci, not including the enterococci, and the staphylococcus epidermidis. And there are some other uropathogens that cause a uh, whole array of uh, uh, di diseases with uh, different signs and symptoms throughout the body, which include TB, candida, actinomyces, cystosomiasis, bucheraria, which cause filariasis, and echinococcus that causes hydrated disease. So E. coli, or uropathogenic E. coli, uh, there are three serogroups that causes the infection. That is the O, 
uh, somatic antigen, the H that is present in the flagella and the K antigen that is present in the capsule. So the presence of K antigen uh, on the bacteria invading, uh, invading bacteria protects them from phagocytosis by the neutrophils. So what makes E. coli the most common organism that causes UTI because of its uh, wide array of uh, virulence factors? As I told, the virulence factors are the weapons that the pathogen has. So it is the degree of pathogenicity of a uropathogen. So it has got fimbriae, a small flagella that allow adherence. It has endotoxin that will allow invasion and provide defense against immune cells. It has iron receptor that allow nutrition. So it can scavenge any iron that is present anywhere. Uh, capsule, its capsule allow immune, uh, allows it to deceive the immune system and cause infection. Its flagella, fla this is uh, the fimbria and this is the flagella. Fla flagella allow migration up the urinary tract through the ureter into the kidneys. And it manipulates lysosome to impair their digestive capacity. So the fimbria causes adherence, the ex exotoxin causes invasion, the flagella gives it an advantage of motility, the iron receptors give it nutrition, and the capsule, which has K antigen and O antigen, it um, makes it easy to slip from the host immune system. So uh, actually, there is um, uh, two types of pili or fimbria that are very important to know. There, there are type 1 that aggl agglutinate guinea pig pig blood and bind to menocyte residues on the uroepithelial cells. They are also called menos-sensitive menos uh, pili. And um, they help bacteria to adhere to the bladder mucosa. Now, this, this causes mostly lower unit tract infections. And the other type, the P pili, you can uh, remember it from the P that it causes pyelonephritis mostly. It is a menos resistant so it does not bind to the mannose receptor in the bladder and it goes up to the urinary tract and cause um, pyelonephritis mostly. 20% of the strain cause lower UTI and 90% of the E. coli because of their FIMH um, uh, protein that is present on the tip. It's a ligand that is present on the tip of the P. pili. It helps it go up to the kidney. Another thing that um, this uh, FIMH protein, it also causes um, adhesion to the uh, host membrane and in, uh, the cell then phagocytos the bacteria, but bacteria is still alive within the cell. cell. So it makes intracellular bacteria uh, uh, biofilms and create, uh, if you see on the cystoscope, it create pod-like bulges on the surface of the urothelium. And they are protected by a protective covering of uroplakin, like I already described. So now this plastic covering, the bacteria is using for its own good. So this makes E. coli the most uh, ha harmful pathogen in the uh, spectrum of the UTI. The second is Klebsiella pneumoniae. It is second to E. coli in causing, for causing bloodstream infec infections associated with a UTI. For example, if a patient has urosepsis, secondary to a UTI, the most common cause is still E. coli. And the second is Klebsiella that causes uh, uh, UTI. It also has type 1 fimbria and it also has a polysaccharide capsule in which there are over 70 antigenic types. Antigenic types makes, um, uh, it's, um, uh, makes for the different uh, development of the vaccines that are um, uh, targeted to the specific kind of that uropathogen. So antigen has that uh, properties. Eclepsiella species also produce a urease, which is, as we read, more commonly associated with Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris. So this is the cute pink Proteus, which has urease. It splits urea into ammonia. U urease splits uh, urea uh, into ammonia and which has a fishy order. It causes urine to become alkaline and it forms true white stones. It commonly causes infection if there is an indwelling catheter is present. Its pili are MR or P type and it also has type 1 fimbria as they are present in the E. coli. It has a urease enzyme which hy hydrolyzes urea into carbon dioxide and ammonia and then it precipitates the formation of true white stones. So there are enterobacterial, uh, um, enterobacterials, 
which are also called coliform bacteria. It includes Enterobacter, Seracea, and Cetrobacter. They cause health uh, care associated UTI in the presence of indwelling catheter. They are um, resistant to ampicillin and cephalosporins. That's why they have such a high uh, burden on the uh, health care uh, uh, budget. Like, in America, it's forty thousand dollars per annum. Then there is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is ubiquitous. It's present everywhere in air, in plants, in soil, in water, everywhere. It's because it has a quorum sensing pathway. Quorum sensing pathway is a pathway in which you see the bacteria is calling its friend. It's a bacterial bacteria signaling thing in which the uh, for, with which the bacteria communicate with themselves and they form very good biofilms. That 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 is why they are resistant to most antibiotics and it gives them a survival advantage. So now Staphylococcus. There are three types of Staph that causes UTIs: that Staph aureus, Saprophyticus, and Coagulase negative Staph. The Staph aureus, and or in our community, it's not anymore Staph aureus. It's methicillin resistant. Staph aureus is the prin prince of pathogens because it has many virulence factors, and uh, the detection of the S aureus in the urine flora may represent contam contamination by the perineal flora or due to the hematogenous spread. It always always uh, causes complicated UTI. It is never an organism that causes that is a cause of uncomplicated UTI. S saprophyticus is uh, second to E. coli in causing honeymoon cystitis. Um, it has a unique adhesion protein, UAFA, which facilitates its adhesion to the uroepithelial cells. And it has various transport protein, which enables it to survive and multiply in the face of osmotic and pH changes. Then there are coagulase negative staphylococci. 90% of them are staph epidermidus, which is a normal commensal of the skin flora. And they are also, they also um, uh, are uh, associated with the hospitalized patient with underlying urological issues. And they can produce autolysins, which bind directly to the plastic and other compounds. They have um, BAP homolog proteins, polysaccharide, intercellular adhesions, and extracellular DNA, and contribute to biofilm formation. Now there are enterococci. Um, uh, enterococci are well established as a cause of healthcare associated infections. Now this is the, these are gram negative rods, and it is making a pissed off face because the doctor, a doctor like us, is trying to give him maybe is afraid of him and trying to give him antibiotics. But enterococcus is just resistant. It's innately resistant to ampicillin and cephalosporins and other common antibiotics. And it is basically actually a very low virulence pathogen. So if you see a, um, a patient who has positive culture of enterococci and does not have symptoms, do not try to give him antibiotics because these are low virulence uh, pathogens who are the good bacteria, who are the commensals of the urinary tract. Group beta streptococci, they are um, uh, associated with the infections in pregnancy. And in, uh, they are associated with increased sexual activity, diabetes, and black ethnic origin. And you need to treat as um, if they are found in a pregnant lady's uh, urine culture. It means that there is heavy colonization pre present. And you need to treat this because of the risks to the fetus. Uh, Corny bacterium is an interesting organism. It is a common skin flora. But it, uh, it, it, it is a basically class of diphtheroids. So, like uh, corny bacterium diphtheria causes uh, hard crystallized plaques in the back of the tonsils and throat. It also causes the same kind of plaques in the urothelium. As you can see, this is a view of urothelium on the cystoscope. It causes encrusted cystitis and encrusted pilitis if it goes up the urinary tract. Um, so candida species, they, it's, it's a form of fungus. Uh, they are uh, white, small fungi, and they are very uh, good in making uh, biofilms and in women urinary drag infection uh, develops by extension because of the vagina uh, and men they cause um, uh, sexual can uh, get sexual candida after uh, a contact with the uh, vaginitis from the candida bkv polyoma virus it was first isolated in 1971 from the urine of a Sudanese renal transplant patient and named after his initial. I tried searching his name, but I could not find maybe because he was a Sudanese, so they did not put the name anywhere. He developed BKV-associated stenosis. 
However, BKV causes causes hemorrhagic cystitis and nephropathy, and um, uh, other kidney problems in renal transplant patients and also in bone marrow transplant recipients. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, we have a whole lecture on it. Uh, actually, most of the time, the TB uh, uh, kidneys are the high oxygen concentration area. So uh, my TB goes from the lungs mostly to the kidneys. And there are other mechanisms also. And they are very resistant to heat and everything. They can form nidases on the urothelium and the kidneys, and which has latent bacteria for decades and decades. And then when the immune system weakens, they uh, grow out. So... Another thing I would like to mention is that Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia trachomatis are not uropathogens. They are usually acquired during sexual contact and do not ascend to the bladder. They go to the epididymis and cause a whole array of different symptoms. So although the urethra is normally the final passageway of, for urine from the body, these specific urethral infections are not usually included in the term UTI. So this is the conclusion that urine was previously considered sterile, but a microbiome is increasingly thought to have protective role. UTI depends on different factors from host and um, bacteria. And biofilm formation is a very big problem, and we need to address it by the change of catheters and by the change of plastics, not with the antibiotics. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you.